There is no topic throughout all of science itself that stirs more little emotions and feelings and political agendas than the topic of evolution. Slip short lunchbox answers to the very questions that matter most. The very same questions, incidentally, the one would ask if they woke up in a ditch. Who am I? Where did I come from? What happens next? A lot of opinions out there concerning evolution. But this is what I believe. I believe that you have the right to look at the data yourself so that you can make your own decision. I'm Trey Smith. You're watching a portion of the DVD, The Theory of Everything. Welcome to the Evolution Test. So, right from the beginning of this thing, we're going to give evolution some really, really big head starts, beginning with the universe itself. At first glance, the universe can sort of look like maybe it's a random place, but in fact, we have known for a long time now that the universe is very far from random. This is commonly termed as the anthropic principle. In fact, more than that, if you were to really look at the physics of this place, you would find 1% off this way, 1% off that way is a bad, bad thing. You and I would not be talking at all. Anthropic means that it has to be exactly the way that it is for us to exist. More than that, when it comes to, say, the cosmological constant, you wouldn't even find an atheist physicist who would tell you that they believed that one was accidental. The fine-tuning of the universe is not a little bitty issue. But, nonetheless, we're going to start with the whole package. Evolution gets the universe, the whole construct, and shebang with all of its precision from the beginning for free. And, within the inside of that universe. We're throwing in the Earth as well. Don't worry about that big number there and all of those impossibilities. We're tossing it into the package for free for evolution as well. Evolution does also appear to defy entropy, the second law of thermodynamics that things decline over time. We see species go extinct. We don't have one recorded example of a new species ever becoming, but we do have plenty of examples of species going away. The dinosaurs would be an example of that. When I say species, I mean an entirely new kind of creature emerging to become. So it violates entropy, but don't worry, we're going to go ahead and give evolution a free pass on that one as well for the purpose of this. It is true that evolution also violates biogenesis, which states, of course, that life only comes from other life. Evolutionist Sir Fred Hoyle stated, and I quote, that believing that the first cell arrived by chance and accident is like believing that a tornado could sweep through a junkyard and create a Boeing 747. It's not just species that we don't see becoming, but on the cellular level, we've never seen a cell come from anything other than another cell. Now, just like entropy, we see cells go away. We see them mutate and, and die, but never see a cell become. And just like the cell, we've also never seen a DNA strand come uh, on its own. A, a digital coding for life, any kind of life, even the smallest form of life, we've never seen the digital coding become. That's another problem. And you need both simultaneously. But for the purpose of this, we're going to do that. It gets the cell and it gets the coding both combined from the start. So I need the digital coding 
for life to happen from in organic materials somehow, whether it be poses sort of a volcano did it or others proposed lightning struck and produced the digital coding or if you want to view that things were shaking around in sort of a cosmic soup, by some mechanism I need actual sophisticated code that is tens and tens and tens of thousands of times more advanced then this laptop and the entire computer setup combined in every single strand. They can't have any junk code in there. It's got to be tit for tat on every line because the digital software is making up the living instructions click by click by click, line by line for life itself. But even though the three-dimensional digital coding for just one single strand of DNA is really incredibly complex for us, that's just where it begins to get tough because now I've got to have trillions and trillions of strands of digital software come together like a perfect glove coordinating in each precision piece to create little bitty fingers and little arms and little legs and little bitty toes. Then I need different kinds of software to all come together for every type of tissue, for the nervous system, for all of the functionality including the human mind itself every organ, every cell, every system, all built and comprised and pulled together from digital software, including all of the billions of neurons that make up the brain. And then, as the final touch, you need the miracle of miracles itself, consciousness. It does sort of seem like an awful lot of very mysterious accidents. Was Dr. Chuck Missler, a man who received congressional appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy, was a former branch chief for the Department of Guided Missiles, serving on the board of directors of a dozen companies, CEO of six of them, helping the Ford Motor Company where he established the world's first international industrial computer network and of course becoming one of the largest at one point shareholders for Western Digital who stated, and I quote, it is only when one becomes truly knowledgeable of science itself that one becomes extremely comfortable with the book of Genesis. But don't worry about biogenesis for the purpose of this test of evolution. Not only are we kicking entropy out of the mix, but we're kicking biogenesis out of the mix as well. Not only that, but I'm going to give evolution all of the digital coding that it needs from the start. I'm not going to require it to have to have lightning bolts or cosmic soups. I'm going to give it to it for free from the start. We're also going to need our symbiotic relationships as well. Everything here, most especially the biological living life forms on this planet, are dependent on all sorts of systems. But there went up a mist from the whole earth and watered the face of the ground. If we were intellectually honest about it, the symbiotic relationships that we would need, particularly for the biological stuff in a single cell to exist in this place, would be trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of things when we really began to poke through and see how many things was actually dependent on and to be intellectually more honest about it, it would probably turn out to be 
the entirety of all of the systems on the earth itself or significant portion of those systems but just to keep this simple for this test of evolution we're going to toss all of that stuff out of the mix in genesis 1 11 it states then god said let the earth bring forth grass the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind single cell again the odds of one cell in this place are 10 to the 39,970 to 1 for one single cell of course anything over 10 to the 50th power in mathematics is considered absolutely absurd they're believed to be 10 to the 82nd power atoms in the entirety of the universe but for the purpose of this we're going to have to at bare minimum give our test the symbiotic relationship of at least the plants and tree yielding fruit whose seed was already in itself after his kind also and God saw that it was good we definitely need the plants because we're breathing oxygen in. These plants are really, really critical. Now, we need many, many things that are beating those same odds coming into existence simultaneously, like these guys here. And if we were to actually take a deep look into the plants, we're gonna find that the systems for the plants that are running the seeds are symbiotic, systems as well you don't get the plant without the seed and the seed mind you is a biological program as well it's got all of the coating intact with no spare coating to make a plant or a tree it's got to have all of its little parts doing all of their little jobs from the start but Nonetheless, for the purpose of this test, it gets the cell, it gets the seeds, it gets the trees, it gets the coating, it gets to violate the entropy, which we observe every single day, that things decline over time, not improve. You and I are also going to give it a free pass on all of the lotto wins that it's got to redundantly win. We're going to give it as many of those as it needs time and time again for the purpose of this test as well as allowing it to ignore all of the symbiotic relationships which would have to develop simultaneously. There's another real big one that we're going to have to kick out of the mix. Mendel's Laws of Genetics. Sort of a large third strike as well as their modern day refinements it's not like we just started studying genetics yesterday we're talking about biological software and I hate to even compare DNA strands to any of our stuff for example DNA uses four bit code our computer software uses two bit binary code little ones and little zeros this is four bit it has to be three-dimensional and configured properly because it's making three-dimensional biological organisms from scratch not only are there no spare parts not just on human beings but on any other species of creature on earth they're all a precision completeness. But more than that, unlike machines that we make, like computers and things of that type, it can do redundant error correction to make sure that this comes out right. And unlike clunky machines made by man, it can self-heal, like cranes and such, that with time the part will wear out in the construct of the human condition the muscles are actually designed to strengthen with use each different type of strand of genetic software the odds against it existing are 1 in 48 with 48 zeros behind it so that's 1 in 48 octillion to 1 against each piece 
of digital software existing at all. Imagine winning the lottery every single day, not missing once. For the next 10,000 years, you would still be nowhere close to that number. Now the odds of one single cell, just one little cell guy, are 10 to the 39,970 to one, give or take. And in mathematics, we know that anything that is 10 to the 50th power to one is a mathematical impossibility. There are 10 to the 82nd power atoms believed to be in the entire universe. So how many times does this number fit into that number above? The answer is this, trillions of trillions of trillions of trillions and this number could keep on going for a long, long ways times the number of atoms in the universe to one against there being one single cell in this place. I went with the low ball numbers on that, by the way. So the machines not only have to be designed to work with the software, but the software has to be designed to give instructions to the machines. So when you hear the scientists marveling, saying how, how can this happen on its own? Why are the numbers this bad? The mathematical miracles happening all over the place. That's why the numbers are that bad. At some point on the timeline, order does have to occur because we're here. Right? Then it's about to get more intense because the digital coding in your cellular factories is about to have to coordinate and come together. That gets you one single cell and all of the factory parts that are moving inside that cell and the little digital DNA software running the cell guy on top of the earth that shouldn't be there and the universe that came out of nowhere. But this right here is the point where the accidents have to go sheer precision. That's a human heart right there, surgical. These accidents have got to be shoved violently into hyperdrive. Millions and millions and millions and millions and that is a very sophisticated piece of machinery. You do not want the digital instructions that are all coming together to create that guy. You cannot have trial and error. A little bit off this way, a little bit off that way would be a bad, bad thing. The programming software has got to work seamlessly with these cellular factories which in their inner worlds are more tit for tat precise, more efficient than any computerized automated factories on the planet Earth. The list of these things could keep on going. DNA is the literal software, the living programming, line by line specific for every single cute soft, warm, and cuddly, and even the strangest of things. Bottom line, DNA is the software which makes up all of the different types and kinds of species on this planet. Each creature has exactly the coding that it needs to become whatever type, kind, or species of creature that it is. There is no junk code in DNA, nor is there junk code in the cells which the DNA software runs inside of, or the organs which those cells make up, or the entire functional systems of the living biological organisms themselves. The Russian silver fox experiments going on now for more than 50 years are one of the more beautiful examples of animals, in this case foxes, producing 
limited to their genetic kinds, the array of variables and appearances within animal types. Look at this first silver fox here. Now look at this silver fox, as well as these cute little silver fox variations produced within the 50-year ongoing Russian silver fox experiments. This is commonly termed as microevolution, meaning that the species can work with pre-existing code within their animal kinds, which is grandly different than Darwinian evolution where things are becoming other creatures and transforming. These animals are restricted within their animal kinds. Bottom line, this fox can have other variations of foxes, but its genetic coding does not contain the information to turn into a whale. Actually, genetically speaking, everything on this planet is losing genetic information. This is particularly observable in viruses, but in all the creatures on the planet, we're actually degrading, just like with entropy, and losing species counts. The current numbers on extinction rate are anywhere between 1,000 species a year to 10,000 between all of these types of creatures and depending on whose numbers that you listen to but we're certainly losing things and not gaining them and the same applies to our genetic coding so in theory if you rewound time the genetic coding in the past further up this line would be stronger in every living creature on the face of the whole earth, the DNA is weakening. It's degrading. Just like when you make a copy of 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 anything, it begins to lose information, not gain it. But don't worry, the DNA is tough digital coding. It's well-built stuff. And every type of creature has zero mutating parts on its body. That would hinder its chances for survival if it had things mutating. Even worse, if it gets any type of genetic defect or mutation, any type of randomness, introduced into this precision tit-for-tat line-for-line coding can not only injure the creature it can kill it that's all just the baseline stuff if we were to leave Mendel's laws of genetics into this test of evolution that would uh, let's just say it kicks up the toughness for this guy here. Another few trillion notches. The genetic software that makes up a bunny rabbit is entirely different from that that makes up a turtle. The two cannot mate. It is a software disconnect. When you're dealing with biological software, just like dealing with regular software, programs and files, the coding has to match up line by line by line. Now, different programs have different coding and they're only designed to work with specifically the coding that works with each program. The genetic coding, the actual digital software, inherent in dogs, at least naturally, without any engineering done, any intelligence or any mucking with the code. The software inherent in dogs will only work or produce other breeds, other kinds of dogs. It's only compatible with other dog types. Same thing applies with horses and those that breed 
horses, with horses, the genetic code inherent in these creatures is only compatible and can only produce by any natural cause other breeds of horses. These genetic laws are particularly important when you're dealing with animals that look very, very similar, if not identical, in many, many ways. They may even have parts within their bodies that are absolutely identical to one another. Appearances can be deceiving, just like if you had two separate factories with similar or identical machines in each one, yet both factories are running different genetic software. You probably heard it said that horses or animals that were like horses wanted to reach tree branches which were way up high so the horses over time grew longer and longer necks so that they could get at those taller branches eventually becoming giraffes. The truth is that the genetic coding for a giraffe and its biological systems are not even remotely close to the systems of that of any type of horse. Just like with computer software, you need a source for every single line of code. Coding does not grow, it does not magically appear, whether it be biological coding or whether it be computer coding. And if you're missing code, if any of the digits are off, your system crashes, your animal is in trouble. It's not the little train that thought it could. This is real coding that you need for every part, including a different circulatory system. This is not just wishful thinking, I want to click up a larger neck. This is real. You need actual Tit for tat for tip for tat, line for line for line for line, digital coding for every cell, every function, every part. All the way down the neck of this animal are blood vessels, arteries, which have literal valves. This is going to take more walls of digital coding that will shut off and keep blood so that when it goes down for a drink of water it will not pass out which would most definitely injure its chances of survival if it's trying to run or get away or it passes out and drowns in the pool of water or if the animal simply passes out every time it goes down for a drink it's also got special sponge-like material on its mind to capture blood in. Those take more software so that when its neck goes up and down that it will not again pass out and go unconscious. And to run these extra apparatus of the long neck it needs a two and a half foot long heart, give or take. Entirely different heart, that's going to be a bunch of these pumping all of that circulatory blood through this long neck. This isn't just a couple of little knickknacks that are different. This animal has an entirely different body plan. Software after software after software. If it were missing one piece of any part of this, this animal, the giraffe, would not exist. Once again, from inorganic material, I need trillions of lines of precision three-dimensional software to mysteriously appear. And all of the precision factory machines to ultimately become a giraffe. It cannot stop there. From the inorganic material, it's got to also make trillions of more lines of code and the unbelievable machinery that has to go through and do all of the reading and the duplicating to make 
complete baby elephants from inorganic material. But the inorganic material definitely cannot stop there. Bukus and bukus and bukus of point by point, no nonsense precision in every piece. Punches of more living, breathing biological machines that somehow just strangely become. Cells are not just factories, they are literal living, breathing cities. Look at that thing go. Whirlwinds more coding to make lions, alligators, and the most vicious things on the planet Earth. Rivers more code. From more inorganic material to make even the cutest of things on this planet as well as every single living breathing creature on the face of the planet earth it's a lot of lightning bolts in the construct of this place, the matrix of the material world, this thing that we call reality, the entirety of the little particles which make up the universe. Everything here is a causality, a cause and an effect. This becomes particularly important in science when you can see the effect of something but you cannot see the larger scale of what caused it. You know, it's also true that a created thing can never understand the scope of what created it. A literal mastery of biological hardware, but it's not complete until, boom, you got your consciousness Never forget the cherry on top, right on top of all of it. Sort of like being plugged into Wi-Fi, huh? The real you, and neurons and little connections coming down the spinal cord. Almost like there's something larger going on here than mortgage payments and car notes. Look, here's the paradox. Let me lay it out for you. You can see the hyper-intensified order all inside every little detail of the place but you cannot see the source from which that order comes even if it's dimensionally layered right on top of it we'll get to that the very spot within the life sciences where the matrix of all the little bitty fabric of machines and cells and parts that have come together to make the beautiful construction of these biological machines within the matrix of this place gets smack dab hit with the neurosciences. There is no point within those two sciences alone where you're going to run into the metaphysical, the dimensional, and the spiritual faster than that point to give all of these precise directions to the parts right at the moments that you think about them. I mean, some kind of a point of translation. I mean, there's got to be a little bit more going on in there than just little electrical connections. In both the Greek and Hebrew texts, it refers to the human body as a temple that are zipping this way and that, not in any random fashion, mind you the ghost and the machine, the actual intangible conscious being that makes up what you call you operating through a physical apparatus of the human body. The intangible controlling the tangible, the very spot where some might argue two dimensions meet. Right here in Genesis 1.27, it does say that God created man in his own image. It's a bold statement. And 97% of your entire body is all self-functioning. 
from the organs to the cells to every single part of your biological machinery, but you're calling the top shots and experiencing the natural world through five senses. This is not a trite piece of business. Every second you are taking hold and driving the whole machine by the reins. Everything from moving the arms to where you're gonna walk to your favorite flavor of ice cream. How does something as material as the matter of the mind ever give rise to something as intangible as an experience, an idea, or the live stream continuum of thought, which you call you, is not little bitty. In fact, the neurosciences, which, if you were intellectually honest about it, actually began in ancient Egypt and continue to this day, the tools and toys have <laughs> gotten better. As Plato or Aristotle or philosophers all throughout the ages of time, even up till this very moment that you watch this video, would have asked, how does the non-physical control the physical? But the paradox is real. The mind, body, duality, the split, the place where you have the blurring of the lines between what they'll call the dimension of consciousness and the material world. In fact, it's not just a blurring fuzziness of the lines. That's the exact point where physical and spiritual twist. Inside this construct, there are billions and billions and billions of neurons that are all acting with little synapses firing this way and that. It's translating. It's a receiver. Nobel Prize winner neurophysiologist Sir John Eccles stated, and I quote, the human brain is a machine that a ghost can operate so that you can have control of this entire being passing down the spinal cord into the fingertips and every part of your biological body. But what are we really? What is the, the soul? But this is more than just a computer sitting on top of a biological machine. Just like you'll hear researchers ask, what is the source for the digital coding that makes up the software, the DNA of human life? This question here is a granddaddy beyond human imagination, larger in scope than that. In fact, the very type of questions that have pushed many of the greatest minds throughout all time to the brinks of their research. Who are we? Where do we come from? What happens next? It was Albert Einstein who said, and I quote, in consideration of the cosmos, the order of the universe, which I, with my limited human mind, am able to perceive, Yet there are those who say there is no God. What makes me really angry is when they quote me in support of such views. That was Albert Einstein. It's very rare that you would ever find any quote where Einstein would say he was angry about anything. Yet so often I hear men quote Einstein and say that there is no God in the same sentence. Just within the neurosciences as well as the life sciences sitting right on top. Life sciences, neurosciences, and that human mind and consciousness all meet. There is no point in just those two sciences, almost like a gateway, huh? We haven't even made it to the quantum physics and the fabric of this place yet. You've probably heard it said that the eyes are the windows to the soul, a statement whose origin is actually derived from Matthew 6.22. 
But the truth is, the illusion is a lot deeper in scope than that. Because it's not actually the eyes that see anything at all. The most advanced camera in the world, literally plugged in and tuned to the frequency of the material world. They're collecting the waves of light, which at their base are little quantified digital units, packets of light that enter through the eye. Solidness is an illusion. And when you're looking at something, you're actually seeing every color it's not. You're seeing the color that it rejects. But it's not just about the color of something. If you were to really look at reality the way that it is, it's comprised of zipping little digits, quantized units, 99.9% .9 empty space. It was Nobel Prize winner Niels Bohr, who, mind you, gave us an actual model of the atom who stated, and I quote, those who are not shocked by quantum mechanics have not yet understood it. The fabric of this place, the little data points making up the material world. But it's sufficient at this point to simply understand that what you're looking at is data coming in through the eye, going down the optic nerve, translating into images, and then hits your consciousness, the intangible part of you, plugged in right now, real time, live stream all the time, which is calling the shots on the whole show. This very much implies that the real you is much more than the software, the hardware, or the biological machine. It does seem like there's a little bit more going on here than what meets the eye. Let me ask you this. If your consciousness is separate from your physical body and your physical body dies, then that would have to mean that you still exist, right? Let that one sink in a minute. At the inception of the book of Genesis, it starts with a fascinating statement that says, in the beginning, the God of gods, Yahweh, created everything. Now the use of the word God in the Hebrew, in that sentence, Yahweh, means something a lot larger in scope than Zeus or a man in the clouds with a lightning bolt. It's actually stating in the text that our dad is larger and more unimaginable in scope than the construct of every single three-dimensional particle pixel in the quantum live feed of little dots making up the precision framework of this present illusion, the fabric of the entire place. And the text goes on to say, and the earth was without form and void. Now in the original Hebrew, that sentence actually reads, and the earth had become without form and void as if to indicate that the place itself, the entire construct, is older than where our story begins. It goes on to say, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Now many, many commentators have speculated on that passage that it's talking about the water and the oceans, and that is a possibility. What's interesting is that the word darkness is a very, very heavy metaphor word. You know, I'm wondering if the text is referring to just regular darkness or if it's referencing something a little deeper than that. And the word waters or celestial waters in every ancient culture 
meant the entirety of the universe, the place where the stars are. So it states, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. Now the word light is another extremely heavy metaphor word, and God saw that the light was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. What's funny is that even as a human and uh, designing something on a computer per se, what I'll do when I begin a new project is I'll separate my old stuff from my new stuff and make a clean slate. It's at that point in the text that you begin with your dramatic rise in order in the place itself, this systematic rise, almost as systematic and step-by-step -step precise as the order which rises when a DNA strand opens to become a living, breathing life form. Whatever the case, let's swim a little further upstream and see if we can't get our head up above the water. But before we start looking at a larger scope or a smaller scope, in this test of evolution, we're going to have to kick Mendel's laws of genetics out of the queue. They conflict with evolution. Now, Mendel was a contemporary of Charles Darwin. Both men lived and worked in roughly the same time period. Mendel's laws of genetics would go on to be, well, the practical day-to-day -day observable sciences that are used even this very hour that you're watching this video. They're dependent on sciences because they're observable. We can watch them day after day after day after day after day. Whereas Charles Darwin's theory of evolution would go on to violate lengthy lists of other sciences. For example, in Darwin's day, it was believed that life could spontaneously generate by many, many folks. For example, if a mold were to appear, perhaps it had spontaneously generated. Of course, we now know that spontaneous generation does not occur. It was Dr. A. Fleischmann, zoologist at Erlingen University, who stated, and I quote, the theory of evolution suffers from the gravest of defects which are more and more apparent as time advances. It can no longer square with practical scientific knowledge. The law of information systems. Information always has a source. Dr. David A. Kaufman, University of Florida Gainesville, stated, evolution lacks a scientifically acceptable explanation for the source of the precisely planned coding within cells without which there can be no proteins, hence no life. Specified complexity sort of goes hand in hand with the law of information systems. What you're looking at is specific information. Click, 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 click. It is not random, a little bit this way, a little bit that way. It is direct streamline instructions that build living biological organisms, irreducible complexity. The entirety of that organism is comprised of organs and parts, all of which it needs. Those parts are comprised of cells which require all of their parts. Those cells are run by digital software which require all of their coding from the information systems to run the inside of the cells. All of these parts are made of quantum particles, which are not random either. It is irreducibly complex from bottom to top. Statistical mathematics is not evolution's friend by any stretch of the imagination. Natural selection. If you have two dogs, bald dog, hairy dog, snowstorm comes through, environment changes, I lose my bald dog, I've got less dogs than I started with. Natural selection or survival of the fittest 
goes hand in hand with entropy. As environments change, resources go away, you see species drop off of the map. This is why we observe species die or leave, but we do not see new species become. Natural selection is not a friend of evolution. The fossil record. Tom Kemp of Oxford University stated, and I quote, as is well known, most fossil species appear instantaneously in the fossil record. Genetic complexity, information theory. The truth is that if we were to really go through the entire list of places where there's a 180 degree conflict with evolution, we would be here for weeks. So, I'm going to rip all of it out right this second, toss it to the side, level playing field, let's put evolution to the test. It was in 1859 that Charles Darwin proposed the origin of species, that things evolve into other things. So see the dog, he jumped in the water and he uh, is deciding he's going to sort of uh, grow these, these fin-like things. See, so the dog ultimately turned into a whale. See how the, the theory works? Now, <laughs> mind you, in, in 1859, when this was proposed by Darwin, it was believed at that time that a single cell was as complex as a ping pong ball. And God created great whales and every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kinds. So here's one of the proposed charts or ascent transition lines for evolution and you can see the the drawing here is indicating that the fish is growing arms which are going to form a different head and become a tail and now it's it's getting fingers down here the problems with this are intrinsic beginning with of course the digital programming code of DNA is just like software coding for a program. If a program picks up any junk code, error code, or mutation code into any of the lines of its complete coding, it will by no means make a better program. Even a single human finger is beyond imagination in precision programming scope but the problems are larger than even the genetics for practical example you may have heard it said that dinosaurs became birds a bird's wings make the neck on the giraffe look like absolute child's play. You are talking about going from a functional leg on an animal into an apparatus, a functional apparatus that flies. If you took every piece of sophisticated military hardware for aviation that we have ever devised, collaborated them into one single entity or organism, you would be nowhere close to the sophistication of the systems on one single species of bird. Our best technology, some of it extremely impressive, but also in terms of practical reality, primitive, sort of clunky, as well as resource consuming, inefficient and often very catastrophic by comparison to this creature right here, majesty of just one of these biological masterpieces. The birds sort of make the whole flying thing look easy, don't they? Not to mention the fact 
that if you've got a leg becoming a wing, it's going to be a bad leg long before it makes a good wing. If an animal was mutating in any way, that's going to injure its chances for survival. Not one change of species into another is on record. We cannot prove that a single species has ever changed. That quote is from none other than Charles Darwin himself. Now each program on this screen has exactly the coding inside of it that it needs at the very start. Otherwise the program would not exist. So if I've got a monkey that is slowly turning into a person, there has to be actual cellular coding for every little tiny piece of the transition. Just like these computer programs on this screen will only open to become what they are because their lines of software coding only have the specific line-for-line -line instructions to open and become whatever the program is. You need precise code for every single line because just like computer software, this coding has no extra instructions for making spare parts. It has exactly inside those digital instructions the coding that it precisely needs to make the organism exactly as it is with no spare coding. What do you imagine might occur if I took one of these programs on this screen and began adding random lines of mutant junk code to one of these programs on this screen? Would it increase and make the program evolve to become a better program? Or option B, do you think that adding random code, junk code, and mutation code to precision genetic software might not ever get a dog to change body plans and all of its genetic coding and become a whale. So what do you think? If we were to add junk code to one of these pieces of software, one of these programs, does the program fall apart or does it become a better program? And whatever the case, evolution is stating that random accidents in the precision genetic coding began to accidentally spit out every direction and every kind of creature and species on the planet Earth. Despite the entropy, biogenesis, and all of Mendel's laws of genetics, and also ignoring all of these basic day-to-day -day observable sciences, one would anticipate that the evidence for all of these transitions, which would have to occur, spitting out mutant animals and creatures in every conceivable direction, should be readily available and easy to find within the fossil record. Strangely though, the evidence on the entire face of the whole planet Earth for all of this science-defying activity seem to be primarily confined to this single set of monkey bones. Jeffrey Schwartz in his book Sudden Origin stated, and I quote, Given that evolution, according to Darwin, was in a continual state of motion, it follows logically that the fossil record should be rife with examples of transitional fossils leading from less to more evolved. Yet instead of filling in the gaps in the fossil record with so-called missing links, most paleontologists have found themselves in a situation where there are only gaps 
in the fossil record with no evidence of transformational intermediate between documented fossil species. So despite just what Charles Darwin said in his own day, that there is no evidence of species changing from one to another, and the fossil record working to further illustrate that animals stay within their spectrums, not seeming to have fossils that change into one another. Ben Eldridge stated in his book, The Myths of Human Evolution, and I quote, The fossil record flatly fails to substantiate the expectation of finely graded changes over time. Despite all of that, the fossil record and all of the sciences, let's go a tad bit deeper. Because one would think, if you were going to search for evolution, surely you would find it in the simplest of insects. Now it is true that since the early 1900s, almost 100 years now, we've been doing fruit fly experiments. Tens of thousands, probably millions of generations of fruit flies at this point have been bred in labs and they do all sorts of weird stuff to them to try and encourage mutations or trying to get them to have a mutation that has a genetic benefit as well as pass it on. Basically, they're trying to prove evolution. At this point, with tens of thousands of these that have occurred, the, st <laughs> the statement that arrives from the fruit fly experiments is that uh, they appear to be immune to evolution. And they use the fruit flies because they have short lifespans, about 11 days. And on top of that, the flies are really inexpensive. They're cheap. In fact, it was it not Morris Cawry who said, out of our 400 mutations, there's not one that can be called a new species. Or Norman Macbeth, who quoted, if a thousand mutations were combined all into one specimen, we still would not have a new species. So this guy here is a motor protein headed towards the nucleus of the cell on these little bitty highways that or perhaps you may prefer Francis Hitching, hardcore atheist, mind you, who stated, and I quote, the fruit flies refuse to become anything other than fruit flies under any circumstances yet devised. He's battery charged by the mitochondria, or just for good measure, how about Gordon R. Taylor who stated it's striking. The geneticists have been breeding fruit flies for more than 60 years all around the world. Flies which produce a new generation every 11 days. Yet they have never seen the emergence of even as much as a new enzyme. And these guys here are little bitty turbines which are turning and they're powering billions of little mitochondria batteries. But even if you find deterioration in the insects and you, you can't find evolution in them, surely at least you could find some kind of improvements happening even in the microscopic world, the little bitty cells, wouldn't you think? And it's not just the fruit flies that they've been trying this mutation thing on, mind you. Michigan State University evolutionary biologist Richard Linsky and his colleagues have searched for signs of evolution in bacteria, single-celled bacteria now for more than 20 years, tracking more than 40,000 generations. And in the end, right now up until today, every part of the cell is doing a job that functions some other part have been, at bare minimum, just lateral most in sheer volume, degenerative, a fact which caused University of Bristol bacteriology professor Alan Linton to state, where's the experimental evidence? None exists in the entire history of mankind, more importantly, the history of science itself on the entire earth. There's not one experimental example to date of a cell mutating one single upward notch of function or new improvement. And it's not for lack of trying, interestingly enough. Where's the experimental evidence? Alan Linton continues. None exists. Bacteria with generation times of 20 
to 30 minutes. But throughout the 150 years of the science of bacteriology, there is no evidence that one species of bacteria has ever changed into another, despite the fact that populations have ex been exposed to potent chemical and physical mutagens. The cell needs all of its parts to function. Those parts all work together as a whole. If something comes in, like a, a virus attacks the cell or the cell mutates for some reason, this not only can injure its chances of survival, but more than that, can actually kill the cell, can destroy the cell. It has to be healthy and functional with all of its pieces doing their jobs. If something comes in and interferes with that, it doesn't become a better cell. Allen continues, since there is no evidence for species changes between even the simplest forms of unicellular life, is it not surprising, he continues, that there is no evidence for evolution throughout the whole array of multicellular life on this planet. That was Dr. Alan Linton. The biological life forms on this planet are not just comprised of little bitty cellular factories that are more sophisticated than every single automated factory on Earth combined into a space so small that you can barely see it with our largest microscopes and then run with digital precision software. But the inside of those cells are made of, of little bitty machines all doing things so that you and I can even exist at all. It was Dr. Doug Axe and Dr. Ann Gogger that came up with these numbers here. Assuming you started with your complete cell, your complete earth, and you've got your digital software running inside the cell, now you need coordinated mutations, coordinated accidents to occur within these strands on the DNA. So, to get six coordinated mutations to produce one new beneficial function on the inside of a single cell would take 16 billion years. 16 billion years is the currently believed age of the entire universe. I didn't like their numbers so I kicked it way up. <laughs> Why not? The one trillion coordinated mutations. That would be almost enough for one earthworm, give or take, on this planet, which shouldn't mathematically be here. If we were to speed him up, he's actually walking a lot faster than that. I don't know. It just doesn't look random to me. You know, I'm thinking that the answers could very easily be a little bit larger in scope. Maybe the history of the place might could bring some illumination. This is Trey Smith and you just watched a portion of the DVD, The Theory of Everything. The entirety of that DVD is roughly three hours long and of course that portion that you watch deals heavily with the controversial topic of evolution. It's difficult for me personally to place faith in any science that dependency and defense mechanism is to mock or ridicule anyone that would question it. This is, in my mind, the exact reverse of what science is. Any theorem, whether it be evolution or any other theorem that's put forth, if it can't be subjected to even the simplest, most basic of testing, then there's already a problem. These images that I have on the screen behind me were at one point declared by Darwin to be perhaps the best evidences for human evolution. Comparing animal embryos to this line down here, which is allegedly 
a human development in the womb. Of course, these images were found to be a fraud in the late 1800s. Yet interestingly enough, they're still often used in textbooks in elementary schools, high schools, and even college textbooks right now, today. You would get flat out sued in any medical facility if a doctor tried to pass these pictures off as actual images of fetal development. It's 2013 and the best images that we've got to give to our kids are fraudulent images from the late 1800s. The only other places I can find this particular set of images used historically in textbooks would be in Nazi Germany. This image on the screen is called the Nebular Hypothesis. The Nebular Hypothesis was first come up with by this man, daydreaming of angels here on the screen, Emanuel Swedenborg in the 1700s. Claimed right now to this day in many textbooks to be the strongest evidence of the evolution of our universe. The nexus between the Big Bang producing our little bitty Earth and of course Darwinian evolution. Of course it's known right now today, the very moment that you're watching this video, that the outer planets contain all of the angular momentum of our solar system, the Sun having 99% of the mass, roughly. Of course, this is exactly the reverse of what should be the case if the nebular hypothesis were in fact true. Shh! Don't tell anyone I told you this, but both the mathematics and the physics to disprove the nebular hypothesis were available in the 1700s. Swedenborg was a self-proclaimed psychic and claimed to have gotten the theory through a seance that he performed. Who could have possibly guessed that the nebular hypothesis might not be true? That little kicker is that two of the planets in our solar system spin the opposite direction. That would of course be Venus and Uranus. That would be a big no-no under the nebular hypothesis. You're also missing the mass for the gases to come together and form the sun, most certainly to form the planets. That's another kicker of a problem. Those are just a pinch of the technical reasons why it doesn't work. His 17th century seance, our modern textbook science right now, today. Makes perfect sense, right? The truth is that I could keep on going through long, extensive laundry lists of these things. And what they all coincidentally share in common is that they encompass one single theory from 1859, Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, otherwise known today as evolution. None could argue this, that we are certainly a far cry from Einstein in this hour. Speaking of Einstein, let me quote him to you. In consideration of the cosmos, the order of the universe, which I, with my limited human mind, am able to perceive, yet there are those who say that there is no God. What makes me really angry is when they quote me in support of such views. That was Albert Einstein. It's very rare that you would ever find any quote by Albert Einstein where he said that he was angry about anything. Yet so often I hear men quote Einstein and say that there is no God in the same sentence. You're living in the hours that the greatest minds that ever lived would have given anything for with the data right in your fingertips. This man here is Max Planck, the father of quantum physics, the study of the very fabric of every particle of this place, who stated, and I quote, all matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force. We must assume that behind this force 
is the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. That was Max Planck, the actual father of quantum physics itself. I have a difficult time believing that either one of these men, as well as many, many others, the brilliant minds throughout our time, were entrusting their calculations or their sciences to 17th century seances. I have an even more difficult time believing that either one of these men would have tried to convince me that they believed that dogs, given enough time, could turn into whales. In studying ancient history, per se, one of the things I've noticed redundantly is how often those who will boast themselves as the wise can so often redundantly prove how easy it is for one to intellectualize their way into absolute idiocy. Conversely, those who would appear on the surface so often as the most foolish amongst our numbers can literally stumble their way into sheer brilliance. I'm Trey Smith. Thank you for watching this portion of the DVD the theory of everything. The theory of everything, full length DVD available at godinanutshell.com, virtually guaranteed to upset university professors, as well as cause significant disturbance to the rebellious 25 year old still living in your basement. If that's not worth $20, <laughs> I have no idea what is. It also sort of does look nice on a coffee table, doesn't it? Also, you may want to take a minute to explore the website Thieves. One dirty TV pastor and the man who robbed him in 1999, I committed a safe robbery on a television pastor named Mike Murdoch. This is the website for that, www.readthieves.com. You can see down here on the bottom of the page, there's me depicted running with a safe. Done a few years ago by, by D Magazine, there's Mike Murdoch, he looks sort of sort of unhappy in that picture. This is a true story. So if you're curious how all that could have possibly gone down, you're in luck. Here's some clips. Thieves by Trey Smith. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere books are sold. I've been on radio and TV for 20 years. And Trey, first, as far as the book itself, I'll give you an example. My producer, Will Duffy, his wife, Danielle, was in the hospital to give birth and they had some time so Will is reading aloud Thieves and not only his wife becomes addicted to it but people in neighboring beds and neighboring rooms all sat in to listen to Thieves being read and it's like Danielle wanted to delay labor because she was so fascinated. Thieves was me pouring literally my heart out day after day. These were all written in a jail cell and guards used to pay me when they were on ship. They would give me extra lunch trays to read them this book. So Thieves was originally paid for the jailhouse lunch trays. And then after the safe robbery when I'm on the run from a television pastor in Mexico it really kicks into high octane. Sometimes I would just stop and say to myself, there's not a lot of really great ways for any of this to end. Crazy as it seems though, it did all end well. I promise. Thank God for that.
I'm pretty certain that you're not going to find anything like this anywhere. I wanted to tack a note onto the end of this video and state to you that that book Thieves from start to finish, no matter how fun it might be to read, does not in any way represent who I am today. And more than that, I've not only asked forgiveness in my own heart, but from a great many parties uh, who are in that book and who are not in that book that I needed to ask for forgiveness from. More than that, I'd like to give a special thank you to ministries, men and women of faith, churches and organizations all across this United States because they are not represented. The hearts of the people are not represented by the few that are just take, 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 take. I have seen so many, both great and small ministries, who no matter who they are, they would give you the last shirt off of their back. And I want to thank them. I'm Trey Smith. God bless every one of you. strand of DNA is really incredibly complex for us, that's just where it begins to get tough because now I've got to have trillions and trillions of strands of digital software come together like a perfect glove coordinating in each precision piece to create little bitty fingers and little arms and little legs and little bitty toes. Then I need different kinds of software to all come together for every type of tissue, for the nervous system, for all of the functionality including the human mind itself, every organ, every cell, every system, all built and comprised and pulled together from digital software, including all of the billions of neurons that make up the brain. And then, as the final touch, you need the miracle of miracles itself. Consciousness. It does sort of seem like an awful lot of very mysterious accidents. Was Dr. Chuck Missler, a man who received congressional appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy, was a former branch chief for the Department of Guided Missiles, serving on the board of directors of a dozen companies, CEO of six of them, helping the Ford Motor Company, where he established the world's first international industrial computer network, and of course becoming one of the largest at one point shareholders for Western Digital who stated, and I quote, it is only when one becomes truly knowledgeable of science itself that one becomes extremely comfortable with the book of Genesis. But don't worry about biogenesis for the purpose of this test of evolution. Not only are we kicking entropy out of the mix, but we're kicking biogenesis out of the mix as well. Not only that, but I'm going to give evolution all of the digital coding that it needs from the start. I'm not going to require it to have to have lightning bolts or cosmic soups. I'm going to give it to it for free from the start. We're also going to need our symbiotic relationships as well. Everything here, most especially the biological living life forms on this planet, are dependent on all. There is no topic throughout all of science itself that stirs more little emotions and feelings and political agendas than the topic of evolution. Slip short lunchbox answers to the very questions that matter most. The very same questions, incidentally, that one would ask if they woke up in a ditch. Who am I? Where did I come from? What happens next? 
A lot of opinions out there concerning evolution. But this is what I believe. I believe that you have the right to look at the data yourself so that you can make your own decision. I'm Trey Smith. You're watching a portion of the DVD, The Theory of Everything. Welcome to the Evolution Test. So, right from the beginning of this thing, we're going to give evolution some really, really big head starts, beginning with the universe itself. At first glance, the universe can sort of look like maybe it's a random place, but in fact, we have known for a long time now that the universe is very far from random. This is commonly termed as the anthropic principle. In fact, more than that, if you were to really look at the physics of this place, you would find 1% off this way, 1% off that way is a bad, bad thing. You and I would not be talking at all. Anthropic means that it has to be exactly the way that it is for us to exist. More than that, when it comes to, say, the cosmological constant, you wouldn't even find an atheist physicist who would tell you that they believed that one was accidental. The fine-tuning of the universe is not a little bitty issue. But, nonetheless, we're going to start with the whole package. Evolution gets the universe, the whole construct, and shebang with all of its precision from the beginning for free. And, within the inside of that universe. We're throwing in the Earth as well. Don't worry about that big number there and all of those impossibilities. We're tossing it into the package for free for evolution as well. Evolution does also appear to defy entropy, the second law of thermodynamics that things decline over time. We see species go extinct. We don't have one recall sorts of systems. But there went up a mist from the whole earth and watered the face of the ground. If we were intellectually honest about it, the symbiotic relationships that we would need, particularly for the biological stuff in a single cell to exist in this place, would be trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of things when we really began to poke through and see how many things was actually dependent on. And to be intellectually more honest about it, it would probably turn out to be the entirety of all of the systems on the earth itself or significant portion of those systems. But just to keep this simple for this test of evolution, we're gonna toss all of that stuff out of the mix. In Genesis 1.11 it states, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind. Single cell, again, the odds of one cell in this place are 10 to the 39,970 to 1 for one single cell of course, anything over 10 to the 50th power in mathematics is considered absolutely absurd. They're believed to be 10 to the 82nd power atoms in the entirety of the universe. But for the purpose of this, we're going to have to, at bare minimum, give our test the symbiotic relationship of at least the plants. And tree yielding fruit whose seed was already in itself after his kind also. And God saw that it was good. So we definitely need the plants because we're breathing oxygen in. These plants are really, really critical. Now, we need many, many things that are beating those same odds coming into existence simultaneously, like these guys here. And if we were to actually take a deep look into the plants, going to find that the systems for the plants that are running the seeds are symbiotic systems as well. You don't get the plant without the seed. 
And the seed, mind you, is a biological program as well. It's got all of the coating intact with no spare coating to make a plant or a tree. It's got to have all of its little parts doing all of their little jobs from the start. But nonetheless, for the purpose of this test, it gets the cell, it gets the seeds, it gets the trees, it gets the coating, it gets to violate the entropy which we observe every single day that things decline over time, not improve. You and I are also going to give it a free pass on all of the lotto wins that it's got a redundantly win. We're going to give it as many of those as it needs time and time again for the purpose of this test as well as allowing it to ignore all of the symbiotic relationships which would have to develop simultaneously. There's another real big one that we're going to have to kick out of the mix. Mendel's Laws of Genetics. Sort of a large third strike, as well as their modern day refinements. It's not like we just started studying genetics yesterday. We're talking about biological software, and I hate to even compare DNA strands to any of our stuff. For example, DNA uses four bit code. Our computer software uses two bit binary code, little ones and little zeros. This is four bit. It has to be three dimensional and configured properly because it's making three dimensional biological organisms from scratch. Not only are there no spare parts, not just on human beings, but on any other species of creature on earth. They're all a precision completeness. But more than that, unlike machines that we make, like computers and things of that type, it can do redundant error correction to make sure that this comes out right. And unlike clunky machines made by man, it can self-heal, like cranes and such, that with time the part will wear out in the construct of the human condition, the muscles are actually designed to strengthen with use. Each different type of strand of genetic software, the odds against it existing, are 1 in 48 with 48 zeros behind it. So that's 1 in 48 octillion to 1 against each piece of digital software existing at all. Imagine winning the lottery every single day, not missing once. For the next 10,000 years, you would still be nowhere close to that number. Now the odds of one single cell, just one little cell guy, are 10 to the 39,970 to one, give or take. And in mathematics, we know that anything that is 10 to the 50th power toward an example of a new species ever becoming, but we do have plenty of examples of species going away. The dinosaurs would be an example of that. When I say species, I mean an entirely new kind of creature emerging to become. So it violates entropy, but don't worry. We're gonna go ahead and give evolution a free pass on that one as well for the purpose of this. It is true that evolution also violates biogenesis, which states, of course, that life only comes from other life. Evolutionist Sir Fred Hoyle stated, and I quote, that believing that the first cell arrived by chance and accident is like believing that a tornado could sweep through a junkyard and create a Boeing 747. It's not just species that we don't see becoming, but on the cellular level, we've never seen a cell come from anything other than another cell. Now, just like entropy, we see cells go away. We see them mutate and, and die, but 
never see a cell become. And just like the cell, we've also never seen a DNA strand come uh, on its own. A, a digital coding for life, any kind of life, even the smallest form of life, we've never seen the digital coding become. That's another problem. And you need both simultaneously. But for the purpose of this, we're going to do that. It gets the cell and it gets the coding both combined from the start. So I need the digital coding for life to happen from in organic materials somehow, whether it be poses sort of a volcano did it or others proposed lightning struck and produced the digital coding or if you want to view that things were shaking around in sort of a cosmic soup, by some mechanism I need actual sophisticated code that is tens and tens and tens of thousands of times more advanced then this laptop and the entire computer setup combined in every single strand. They can't have any junk code in there. It's got to be tit for tat on every line because the digital software is making up the living instructions click by click by click, line by line for life itself. But even though the three-dimensional digital coding for just one single 